we're live. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back again to Digital Rebar Provision, meetup number 25. Makes it our silver. It's 25 silver. Sure. We'll pretend like it's silver. Yeah. 25th uh, silver anniversary, so to speak. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today, we've got uh, more crib, Kubernetes goodness. Rob is going to talk to us a little bit about Helm Advanced uh, Patterns and deploying applications with the Helm Advanced Pattern. Uh, the demo we're going to provide today is Istio, which is the service mesh uh, component that provides sidecar service mesh for uh, HTTPS encrypting applications between Kubernetes clusters and uh, access controls and all kinds of other goodness for application stacks in Kubernetes cluster. We're going to talk about a bug scrub. It's been a while since we've done a bug scrub. A lot of stale bugs out there we need to clean up and get sorted out. And as always, we'll provide a forum space for community, et cetera, feedback, communication, et cetera. Uh, today with us, we have myself, Shane Gibson, and Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, Rob has Greg Althaus on the phone with him there, and Victor Lowther as well. Welcome, guys. And we're missing uh, the eponymous Steven Spector. He couldn't make it for, with us today, but that's okay. We'll have him catch up and review everything and give him a test on today's meetup when he gets back. Uh, from community, we've got Chris and Chris, Chris in the form of Cat and Chris in the form of CJ. And Stan Chan, welcome, guys. Appreciate you guys attending and joining. Come back, Stan. <laughs> uh, Rob, are you ready to kick off with a uh, demo? Uh, you're good to go there. I can, and, and then one of the things that I think we're gonna do is I was I sat down this morning to make um, a change to the to the demo <laughs> to the scripts uh, so that we could install Rook. Um, and uh, Greg brought up a whole bunch of good questions about about the pattern, and so I, I actually would will extend this into a conversation about some of the patterns that we're seeing, and we can talk through. Uh, some of those realizations. Let me um, make my screen a little smaller and then I'll share it. I'll share the- Rook the, being the storage orchestration for Kubernetes? Yeah, Rook is, all right, I got, I'm gonna Rook stop IO. screen. Rook, Rook is a uh, Ceph or Cockroach D. They store all sorts of storage um, things. Yep. Cool, I have not seen this yet. Um, and, and so actually, before we jump, and you, since you have it on the screen, can you go to the Rook install? And I'll tell you what the what interesting problem. Uh, go to about. the Rook install, be more specific. Actually, I have it on my screen, so just. All right, fine, you can have control. Okay, so let me try again and see if I can share just my, yay, just my window. That is excellent. And I might even have the Rook stuff up, here it is, okay. Ah, uh, yay. All right. Um, maybe I should explain the Istio stuff before I jump into the Rook stuff. So yeah, let's, um, well, let's back level a little bit to the Helm Advanced pattern, what the, the difference is between Helm Advanced and Helm Standard, so to speak, and then um, why we chose to go with Helm Advanced, and then, then let's take a look at Istio and then jump to Rook from there. That makes sense. Um, so Helm standard is gone. Uh, I've switched everything over to use the Helm advanced pattern. Um, and to, to explain why, you, you have to understand a little bit about um, Helm, uh, but that's not hard to explain. So when, when you install Helm, uh, where's my, here's my Helm. So Helm is, Helm is the, the, the work we've done before in set installed Helm, which has two parts. There's a client and a server. And the whole goal of the system is to be able to do this Helm install chart. And we talked about this, I think, two weeks ago, where you basically Helm install stable MySQL, and it goes, looks it up from a repo, and then installs MySQL for you, which is super, super cool. And so the, the functionality we showed last week or two weeks ago was the ability to basically name, you know, take a chart and install it from the stable repo. And that was pretty much all it did. And then you could put a couple of those charts together an array and it would install them. There's a there's a, a unfortunate side effect of that behavior where if the chart is not named, it creates a cute 
um, name for it. So it's, uh, you know, Sleepy Cat, you know, True Texan, I don't know, something like that. Um, <laughs> I've read Sleepy the Texan. I was reading the sticker. Um, I should give it to Greg. Um, anyway, the, uh, anyway, so it, it, what it would do is it would come up with a name. And once you got, called it one of those, those, those uh, uh, auto-generated names, you couldn't then check to see if the chart was installed. And so the whole thing was not idempotent. So the stage couldn't be rerun. And so I sort of got to this point where we were going to force people to name the charts anyway. And so it, I just, the old pattern was not functional. So I, I killed it. So essentially we had to specify a little bit of configuration up front by defining a name for the chart so we can in, ensure guarantees around the idempotency. Right. And so now... But, now what it does is it actually does a helm. This is the minimum set. You get a helm install right. the chart and then the name of the chart and it names it. And then if you specify a, a name, you can specify a namespace or a whole bunch of parameters. So what, what happened is we looked at, um, so we had that functionality and then I, I went to go install Istio, which is a service mesh fabric. And Istio says, the easy way to install Istio is to do it with a helm chart. Yay, which makes perfect sense, but their Helm chart is more complex than the simple Helm chart, right? You need a namespace, you need to set some parameters optionally. Um, ideally, you want to wait until all those containers come up. Um, I looked at some other examples of complex Helm charts, uh, most notably OpenStack Helm. Um, I looked at Rook, but not carefully enough, and then realized that there were some patterns that we should implement for Helm charts more generally. Uh, this opens up a, another problem, which we'll talk about after I've, I've shown the Istio piece. Um, fundamentally, what the system is going to do now is if it's first going to check to see if you have Helm installed. And if you don't have Helm installed, if you don't have that chart installed, it'll work. There is no upgrade right now. And then I, I added in, I'll, I'll show you what these parameters look like, but I added in some extra features that let you prep uh, the chart. So for example, the Istio chart is not in any repo, any, any stable repo, it's in GitHub. So in order to get Istio installed, you have to be able to download their targz of the, of the repo, of the, the release. You have to untar it and then install. And so, right, we sort of, we've been creeping in these, these feature sets where you need to do more and more complex things. Let me actually show you what the, uh, so in, in crib uh, parameters, if you were to look at the helm, let's see, it's going to be under OH helm, helm charts. I actually put some time in trying to make this documentation really good. You actually can specify name, chart, namespace, all these things. So here's an example, the example one for Istio. Um, that sets the location of the targz, name of the chart. Um, so this ends up being a little bit of metadata uh, wrapper around the specific Helm chart you want to install, which expands on just the name concept. Right, and and this so the MySQL example is this. It's this is what we replaced out of this, the old one. You need to provide a chart and now a name. That's the minimum two things that you would need to to make this go. And then, you know, there's, I actually provided some docs and, and things like that because uh, it made a lot more sense. The way that ends up looking in, in practice is I now have a cluster um, that I have in this optimized state. So it's gone all the way through Docker install. It's downloaded the kube components and things like that. In this cluster profile, I have the Helm chart for Istio set up. So I've, I've got the chart, the name, I've identified a namespace. This, is, this parameter is actually defaults to true, but I, I left it in as an example. The location of the source code, and then uh, I, I turned on the weight equals true, uh, and I'll show you what that, that does. It basically it makes, waits until all the containers in the namespace are running so that you can stage container uh, charts together and let one come up in a sequence. If you turn weight to false, it, it just brings them up as fast as it can. I have a video of this too. Um, it just shows this. So if I go back to the machine actions here and throw it through a... Um, can, before you change, uh, change a workflow, sir, can you go back to the 02 workflow and just show us your 02 prep? Yeah. 
Yeah. There so we go. So the standard. Go ahead. Yeah. So just the standard discover, access, mount disks, install Docker, install Kubernetes. Yeah. Right. Okay, perfect. So that's that's pretty straightforward. And if you look at what I'm gonna do next, which is um, prep to cluster. And so one of the things that we can talk about is we're starting to build out a lot of these read-only profiles, um, workflows, and so we should we should decide how if we want to keep doing that. I've been I built a prep cluster that just does the minimum configuration and then includes Helm. So this is so my development pattern. It's probably useful to talk about my development pattern. Is I grab two machines, and so I always keep two machines in in this prep state. So it's super fast for me to set up a cluster. And then what I'll do is I'm going to grab two. I'm going to go prep to cluster. I'm going to say go. And at this point, I have these two machines building the cluster. These two machines are in standby. And when, I'm, when I need to reset the cluster, I reset the cluster here, reboot those machines, and then just jump over to this prep to cluster. And so that, the consequence of that is like with the Helm charts, I have to sometimes reset the whole cluster. I can be reset inside of a two minute window. It's barely enough time for a, you know, go get coffee and come back to your desk time. Um, and so uh, in this case, right, we're now going through kube config. I could throw another machine in, oh, it's already elected. So this is how fast it's, it's moving through this process um, compared to if I had to install Docker or download other components, it's just prepping it. Uh, Shane, at some point I know we'll, we'll build a prereq image that has this stuff Are, and that's probably already stuff. done okay I, I already deploy with uh, um, image deploy and a pre-built crib cluster it has uh, docker and kubernetes installed uh, what i need to do is throw it into cicd into um, travis or something so it builds automatically and pick up new versions have versioned okay. versioned instances right now the the other thing that would be um, interesting for that is to actually tell Docker to download the containers that are getting pulled in because most of this wait time is actually yeah uh, it's pulling the, the Kubernetes containers in right and so you could you could even prefetch those um, I mean it's not that much wait time <laughs> but it, uh, in you know when you're building a cluster five or six times a day or ten times a day it, it does add up slowly um, so we're about to get into the Helm chart stage, which is what I'm stalling for. Um, that's going to take a little bit. Um, I didn't disable like the UX being installed, which is one of the things that's done by default and it takes a little bit of time, but we don't wait for the, the UX to finish being in the, the Kubernetes UX to be finished. Um, trying to think, oh, so, so that's, that's the basics. Let me, while we're waiting on that to go, um, the Rook install, fits this pattern very nicely because it says, if you're going to install Rook, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to deploy the operator using a Helm chart. Um, it says it somewhere. You're, you're actually going to do the Helm chart first. And then you need to run uh, kubectl with this, with a variant of this cluster definition, which would look surprisingly like a Helm chart, except that you have to modify it based on the data directory path, which is not predictable. And so every system that runs, you have to set this up. So it can't be run inside of Helm. It has to be run as a kubectl. You have to create the file and then create kubectl. So uh, I'm planning to extend the Helm chart action to let you pick a template to render. And you'll be able to render a template, one or more templates, it'll be an array, before you do any other actions. And so if you look at what we've done over here, you'd be able to set the chart for Helm that it needs and then do a kubectl after and run that template, that, that file I was showing you as a template that would then finish the Rook install. So the same Kubernetes pattern with that one change, the Helm pattern with that one change can be adapted to do any Helm chart or kubectl command that you need to have a parameterized uh, file for instead of a downloadable file. Um, so, okay. it, it's so you can do any prep or post visual, visual on what happened. Correct. And because we do it as a rendered template, you can do it with data that's in the profile 
or on the machine as a setting. So conceivably, you could actually enumerate the disks and include the disk into that profile, into that template if you wanted. You could um, set it in the profile, obviously, and then make it a, a global setting. Um, I haven't figured out just how I want the, the, temp the, the file built. But you could do the same thing for any system that's, that needs environment-sensitive Helm charts. Uh, so literally that the Helm charts, instead of downloading them from TarGZ, you could build them as templates, and, you know, inject them in the system and then have them, um, you know, rendered with environment specific data as part of the Helm chart. Um, if you, if you look at, um, Ro this is a good, Ro Rook's a good example, right? If this could be a Helm chart, except that it needs to have physical information about the system. If you looked at OpenStack Helm, OpenStack Helm has an incredibly complex uh, uh, chart creator that basically is a Golang template that generates a whole bunch of, of system-specific data in the templates and then runs the templates. Um, and so we could actually build those, their templates dynamically um, using uh, digital rebar uh, inventory data or profile data. It's pretty powerful. So one, yeah. one of the other use cases or patterns I see for this is um, as you move towards more operational clusters, you're going to have uh, workers of different types in the cluster. You need to tag those workers and specific Helm charts need to be tied to consume resources from those given uh, tagged workers. So an, a simple example of that might be uh, using, uh, well, it actually ties in with Rook, but if you're using storage and you need to be able to export storage, there are only going to be a given set of uh, machines in your cluster that are going to be storage class nodes that you might have um, actions you want to run on or Kubernetes apps that you run on. And if they're part of the cluster, you want to tag those appropriately and then make sure that your apps are bound to the specific um, tags in the workers. Right. And the, the, the Kubernetes installer we have already builds labels based on inventory data, or you can specify a label set. Um, for that, and then so you could you could extend that feature. So much <laughs> um, and so so in this case, it it did it did tiller because I had the weight. So it did the Helm. Um, it downloaded it. It created all the Helm repos. Um, oh, this had to wait for tiller to get installed. Tiller is its own container, so it had to get brought up. Then this is it downloading the Istio uh, source code. This is it deploying the Istio. Um, code, and then what you'll notice is in, when Istio brings up its pod, it has a whole bunch of stuff that's waiting to be done. Um, and so, right, there's a ton of data coming, flowing out of Istio, and what happens here is that then it comes in and says, okay, wait a second, I don't want to, I'm in wait mode, so I'm going to wait for 20 clicks while uh, kubectl pods namespace Istio is still creating containers. And so it literally goes into a wait cycle waiting until that's done. If I turned on debug, you'd actually see the outputs. Um, and then when it's finished, it says I'm done. And we only have one chart, so it finished. finished that? That one chart. Monday, 9th, 17 at 11.30 AM. <laughs> What's that? Here. Can you be here? Uh, Whoop, we got some background noise. 17, probably not. Monday. Mm, well, what's going on? Crosslink invitation is Team, yeah. Oh, bugger. Yeah. If it was the afternoon, I could do it. Rob, can you mute Cam, please? Yeah, I just did. <laughs> All right. Um, so there was a uh, Chris uh, Trees had a question about Rook. Uh, yeah. He typed. Uh, so his question was, is, or statement really is, Rook is really pr provides a good uh, environment filtered test of DRP inventory. Uh, stepping back just a few minutes ago, how you were talking about tying the inventory piece into Rook. Uh, there's there's probably a, some some extra sugar that needs to be added yet to do it the way you're describing, where you assign Rook only to certain nodes. Um, we're getting closer to those pieces. So the first the first thing I'm going to do is just make it. These, this is still I would still consider this demoware, um, where we're proving out the pattern. Actually, so this is and this is where Greg and I jumped into the our longer conversation. Eventually, yes, is the is it is the answer. Most of the bits and pieces are there, so that we we do label nodes correctly. Um, we could filter Rook based on what this this data is. 
here's here's the dilemma, and this is where where Greg and I had a, a long productive conversation. What I'm showing you is not how we think you should be installing Istio long term. This is a great way for you to experiment with using Istio and see how it works and understand, right? Sort of play with it as a helm chart. And it's good for us to learn what people need for Istio. At some point, we want to create an Istio stage that has a whole bunch of parameterized inputs and def good default values and is a completely standalone Istio stage. It'll probably use the same libraries, but it will be, you know, a, 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 a solid drag it into your workflow and you get Istio. Um, the, the question we get into is when do we create an Istio stage? Uh, in this but couldn't, couldn't that Istio stage simply be uh, calling and injecting the, the Helm chart definition specifically? I mean, I'm not sure I understand the distinction here. So if you want to do advanced Istio, there's probably 10 to 15 parameters that you'd want to inject in it. Yeah. And, and so in, in this pattern, there's no real way, let me go, go back to the, um, right, there's no way for me to parameterize my Istio chart. So if I wanted to do some uh, more parameters, it's, it, there's, no, there's no real way for me to start doing any configuration. What you'd end up doing is telling people to create more and more complex Helm chart blocks. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that the Istio Helm charts currently don't support customization of Istio. Is that that no, the fundamental issue? That, okay. But you're gonna have to, you're so gonna it's start. more a matter of exposing that customization. Right. And so yeah. what we're going to end up doing is we'll end up, if, if we followed that pattern, we'd end up with a document that would say, if you want Istio with left-handed, you know, networking, yeah. and here is the parameter set that you should inject, which is what their docs look like. If you want right. Istio right-handed networking, then you should do these parameters. And that's not a very digital rebar feel to me. And I, I'll speak for Greg. Or yeah, the concern is, right, we can say keep adding these blobs. And that's a story, right? The problem is you've now lost the ability to compose things. Right. You've lost the ability to do parameter validation, right? Documentation of parameter sets, all those kind of things that we've been trying to bring to our stage and parameter sets and task sets so that there's at least information, the ability to control and validate and, and make progress and, and, and move things around. In this model, your composition is build your own charts thing and better get it right. <laughs> and good luck on setting the parameters because we can't validate them. Right. So, right. so the, the thought is, this is great to play with. You can compose this. And if this is what you want to live with, that's great. The, the thing is that I believe, I suspect for the Kubernetes environment, there'll be a class of things that become higher order things that need to be supported, controlled, customized as we learn about them. So Istio is one, Rook is one. Rook is gonna be one. Right? Um, potentially the, um, what is it, RBAC auth system, if they ever figure out that enough to get it pluggable, right? That kind of stuff will have a set of parameters that you want to make sure are coherent, injectable, reusable. And that's traditionally done with our stuff through a profile assigned yep. either to a set of machines or globally or whatever. And then those validations kick in to make sure at least you have a valid data set, you get errors on them, all of that stuff. Yeah. So, that's, so, so that, that's very much like the Kubeatom pattern we've started down where we've taken the Kubeatom YAML configuration, uh, templatized it with a set of things we feel are appropriate for customization to it so that you can then inject that customized configuration uh, file into it for configuration. Ultimately, then we've also provided an override where you can just shove an entire different YAML in place if you have a super highly customized version that we haven't yet parameterized the things you need to change. Right. And and what I what I might suggest what, now that I'm thinking about the pattern is instead of shoving the whole YAML into a parameter to just tell, allow you to inject a profile name and then run the template for that, right? And say, put the configuration into a template 
and upload that and then we're going to run the template for you because that allows us to then still inject uh, digital rebar information into the template which is really useful because we don't want to we don't want to give up rendering renderings value yeah ren rendering is good but there's also um, when you look at things like the, the cube atom pattern there are uh, dozens you know bordering on 50 60 pram uh, values that you can set and we aren't necessarily going to parameterize all of them so in some use cases you may need to just override all of it uh, and yes you lose that you know templatization capability we have in validation of prams etc cetera, etc cetera, but also gives the operator flexibility to be able to at least take, bring their own specific configuration and inject that up front Right. And I, I think when you look at the way I'm going to modify this to do the template rendering, it would give you a way to create a custom chart, right, which is just a template, and then still inject uh, environment data into that chart um, if you wanted to. You, I mean, you don't have to use template, right? You know, the template can just be straight, straight text. It doesn't have to have any substitutions. Mm -hmm. So... And, and this is, this to me is part of what Chris is asking, where the Rook, we're going to have a Rook chart that's, that's sort of dumb as a prototype. And it'll show up as a, in, a, in the charts list or as a way to do a chart. And then what we'll do is take that um, and probably create a stage out of it that has flags to say, you know, pick your machines or, un, you know, assemble stuff and, and does some more analytics because it becomes a useful long-term flow. And so, I guess what we're, we're trying to, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the developer experience with this and what, how we would improve the developer experience and make it easier uh, to make this work. Because this is the way the conversation with Greg and I went was, it's like, Rob, why are you adding parameters that are really building custom tasks? Because that's what this is. This is a custom, this is a, a task builder uh, parameter. And it's not, it, it's not, um, it's obfuscating operational flow because if you don't know what's in that parameter, you can't see it in the workflow. So you have, you have mystery work, which is bad. So the, the answer, the, the question becomes, so why not build a Istio chart or sorry, an Istio stage? Um, and how do we make that, how do we make it easier for somebody to build an Istio stage? Um, I'm not, we, we, I think we came to the agreement that it doesn't necessarily make sense to force people to do that on day one, but we do want to make it easier so that if somebody says, oh, I need Istio, you know, how do I do it in a digital rebar way with stages and tasks and templates rather than in a um, sort of a very parameterized, you know, this, this, this pattern, it does not let, give you the controls uh, that we think are important. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. And, and one, one of the things that came out of that that's worth sharing is, um, you know, we've been creating um, stage task templates in places where there's a one to one to one ratio. You have one stage with one task with one template. Pretty and, heavily. Yeah. What we're, what we're starting, I think what we want to do is say, look, if, if that's your case, then just put the template in the task. Um, so it doesn't create as much spread of code. So there's not, you know, there's not as much Delta putting a task in, you know, moving it all into the stage is uh, troubling. I, I, I get that pattern. Victor likes that pattern. <laughs> um, I don't like that pattern though. Um, I, I get it for two or three kind of lines of do something, one offage. But if you have anything more than half a page of doing something in a template, I, I feel that the editability and uh, maintenance of it goes down when it's embedded in a task because it has to become a part of the YAML stanza. And it just makes it hard to, to deal with. Yeah. Um, modifying, editing, maintaining. I, I agree with you that the, the editing something in a YAML stanza sucks. Um, and, and this is where like a lot of the stuff that is in the Helm chart runner, let me jump back to it. Um, let's see. Templates, Helm chart uh, in here. 
So, so actually, before you move forward a little bit, uh, um, Victor jumped off. Before you move forward a little bit, Victor jumped off mute there. I didn't know if he had a point he wanted to make me <laughs> calling out his uh, pattern. Uh, well, I tend to use it for uh, parameters where, you know, there has to be a whole block of them and they have to be able to um, be changed as a coordinated unit. Mm -hmm. So sort of pre-work. Uh, no, well, like the specification, well, I usually use them for um, plugins and whatnot where the parameter has to drive a whole set of related things where they can't just vary independently. Okay, yeah. No, there's there's definitely a use case for the pattern, but from from my operational work, I I tend to be working sort of in large bash scripts, so to speak, and and that's where I find trying to shove it into a a task is you know you lose syntax colorization and editors and trying to debug various con you know bash constructs in a YAML file, and when you've missed a tick or a quote or something, you start to lose those sort of abilities. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I, I think the thing I like about doing it inside of a task is that you could, the documentation gets, you know, you, it's easier to put the documentation in. Greg, point, Greg points out that some of that's just an artifact of the way we YAMLize templates because they're actually stored in the system as, as objects with full metadata and decorations. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's right. The, the question here is what, reduces the overhead for somebody learning the system. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, my developer side objects to creating an, an item with one item with one item in it, which is just a, it's just, it's noise. You know, it's, it's, it's not a real problem. It's just noise. To, it's a noise. I'm adding, you know, a architectural clarity thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Incidentally, I wrote a script that just, adds a stage task template blank, <laughs> go fill in a little easier. Yeah. And we had some ideas but, about, you know, uh, how to help people create bundles and, and export information and stuff like that. So we're, we want to go through that. We're, we're sort of just watching this, the patterns of people learning how to use the system and how do we make it easier. Mm -hmm. And so like, a lot of this, the Helm stuff in here actually should get exported to become a library and put into Creative Utils. Um, and then it should just be bundled down into one call. And at that point, then all of this moves into a template. And then when I create an Istio stage, it's going to use the same the same Helm libraries, um, which is, you know, that's the way things should, should, should move. And this is just a question of us incrementally evolving the system which is, you know, what people should expect that we're doing. Uh, and okay. then stuff is just, we have, this pattern is happens over and over and over again, right? Wait, wait for something to finish. Sleep escape. There is, there is some, there, there are places I should be reusing code there and I'm not. Okay. That was a, a longer conversation about what what's going on, but it's it's useful to sort of be instructive on on where where we're going, how fast we're extending uh, Kubernetes integrations. Because I, I really feel like this is you know we're adding functionality really quickly, yeah. Lever leveraging community stuff, right? This there's great ecosystem development going on that we're just just exposing basically. All right. I'm going to give up screen share. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Any more on that? Uh, we'd love for people to play with it and test it as always. Um, <laughs> yes, please. It's super fast. Uh, and all of that's currently in tip, correct? Correct. Um, yeah. So the, the crib, crib content pack uh, tip version is what you want to pull today. Um, we have, um, you have, uh, 310 um, DRP version has the um, uh, templating add-on stuff, right? With a feature flag? For Sprig? Yeah, that's right. Sprig? Yeah, okay. So you, you can do it with stable uh, DRP endpoint and crib content tip pack right now. Right. The, the, the new, if you're using the latest CLI, it checks to make sure that the features. So one of the things that, that came in on, on into tip 
uh, and this is this is an important way to protect people with content, is that the CLI will now check. You can add metadata to a content pack. I'll show it. I'll show. Uh, hold on. I'll show you, show people what it looks like because it's useful. This is this is actually really really uh, awesome functionality. Um, so inside of inside of a lot of the content packs we have, they now have a required features meta section, and this has feature flags that. Uh, map to DRP feature. So if you if you look at DRP, if you go into your info block, if you haven't, if you're not aware of it, um, every DRP instance has a set of feature flags that tell you what's enabled in that. Don't rely on the version numbers. Rely on the feature flags because this is how we add add incremental features uh, mid release. But then that the the CLI will now. Um, and the, the, the endpoint also will enforce that if you're asking for content with these features in it, it will require that endpoint to have those features in it. And it will not upload the content without a map, without having a, a match. Uh, the UX will, will let you know also. So the UX is, uh, supports that and is careful. Uh, that's one of the, the tip, in, in tip features. Uh, and it's designed to keep people from having content that relies on something new um, that somebody because we had this happen um, a couple weeks ago you're relying on sprig um, this was a big culprit um, and it wasn't installed on an endpoint and the endpoint would object the right things happened we're just trying to make it so that users don't end up um, surprised no surprised users or at least delightedly surprised users since everybody must have delight in their uh, mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Rob. Appreciate this spin through. Uh, it was pretty cool to take a look at the uh, Helm charts and Helm chart capabilities there and how it's shaping um, crib going forward. And as we start operationalizing a lot of these more complex uh, Kubernetes pieces and we start getting more sophisticated with crib and crib's capabilities, uh, for content and ultimately a lot of these patterns will help us drive into other content packs when we start um, building and, and operating some of the more uh, um, complex content packs that we have going out there. Um, Greg, did you have any thoughts you wanted to cover on all of that? Nope. No, you're just I lunging don't. towards the camera for fun. You wanted to see what was what okay. was in the chat. It was growing and I wanted to make sure that Oh, yeah, I, my chat session keeps going away every time something changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Chris Trees had um, made a point when he was checking out Istio that Istio looks uh, pretty interesting and, and it agreed. It adds a lot of operational capabilities to applications you layer on top of Kubernetes that would otherwise be a pain in the butt to uh, implement, specifically automatic uh, TLS encryption of uh, communications between apps and then add things like being able to graph monitor and alert automatically and to be able to instrument uh, your applications and API calls does a whole lot of really cool things. So if you haven't seen it before, we encourage you to take a look at Istio. It's a very interesting uh, project that has a lot of great features. And in fact, I think uh, Istio comes out of Uber, doesn't it? Uh, uh, Lyft, actually. Lyft. Oh, okay. so, oh so Google. Uh, oh, pa. Uh, sorry, sorry, Sam. Yeah, don't confuse those two. <laughs> and oh, you know, no, it's one a, app, a, potato, a potato, potato. <laughs> he tried. He tried. I should have should have just gone with it. Uh, Envoy is, is out of Lyft. The uh, Envoy is out of Lyft, but it's a sub project of uh, Istio. Istio overall is from uh, IBM, Google, IBM, and the other Google, and, and Lyft. Both, I think, all uh, sort of combined. Lyft, Lyft, yeah. Lyft did not do Istio. That was a Google IBM thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, and the uh, that was an open source <laughs> faux pas there. <laughs> so, all right. Yes, moving I, on. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I'm I'm planning on using Istio for some of my projects, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good, good potatoes there. Good potatoes either way or potatoes. 
Uh, okay, so moving on, we're going to go into Bug Scrub. Um, we're at 11.45 right now. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, if we want to, um, actually, if we want to chuck out questions to community first, uh, let's do community first, and then we'll uh, wrap up with Bug Scrub. Uh, so anyone on community, questions, thoughts, comments for the DRP team? Well, I have a comment for the community. Okay. Um, Victor? So ahead. I just threw a couple of pull requests out there that uh, add some basic multi-architecture multi support to DR provision. Um, yes. If anyone has some ARM64 hardware that they don't mind uh, playing around with, um, we now have uh, some incredibly basic ARM64 support. Um, it is lacking amenities like a, a working sledgehammer, um, the ability to actually finish the OS install process and have a runner going, and a couple of other minor things like that. Um, but uh, if anyone, you know, I'm always uh, happy to have people test uh, the code that I've only been able to test with VMs on, you know, their actual hardware. So. Okay. And, and Victor, are those um, have all pushed to tip so far, or are those on a pull request? They're still okay. on a pull request. Okay. I want to. So, yeah, there's a couple more issues I want to iron out first. So you'd have to pull the branches for the, from the pull requests and build your own uh, community content bundle and a couple of other things. So. Okay. So in our glorious uh, ARM and RISC-V uh, future, we will have support for those architectures uh, as soon as, you know, people are interested enough, interested enough for us, to, for someone to uh, pay us to add them, so. Awesome, so if you're interested in firing up some ARM, RISC-V, uh, well, ARM specifically right now, uh, ping us on community channel, we'll help get you connected to the right branch. Uh, like what Victor is saying, we always uh, look forward to feedback from people playing with the stuff in the field. It's important for shaping uh, operational capabilities and features and also helping us shape roadmaps. So those are important things. Uh, anything else uh, around community? I was going to make a comment that the Terminator T800 models were all ARM-based, so just to say. <laughs> so pretty soon we'll be controlling all the Terminators in the world? That's the, we're going we're gonna to enable them to reboot on demand. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to bug scrub. We currently have 48 open bugs. Uh, we usually tackle this top down. Actually, it's bugs and features, I should say, uh, across both DRP endpoint and UX. And I suspect an awful lot of these are pretty stale. Uh, so let's, um, Greg, do you have a preference of which way you want to tackle these? Uh, no. No. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, just start in a direction and, and go. It may be better to start with the more recent ones because those are more fresh on people's pressure. Than whatever. All right. So let's do that. All right. So we've got uh, number 980, uh, Oracle support, um, Oracle Linux support. We had sort of picked this up a little bit. Uh, Pizza Pie uh, submitted this. Um, I don't think we've tackled this. It's something we'd like to add, but we haven't really tackled the boot env issues here. Any feedback? Yeah, so this is parsing the documentation and adding a default for the package repos. Basically, the package repos don't know how to do that, handle that line. So it just, yeah, we need to standardize on what Oracle Linux looks like inside of a DR provision. That's a, it's an annoying thing that we have to do for all the rail variants because they all use slightly different uh, paths on how they build um, references to their yum repos, so. Okay. Um, so I think it's good enough to annotate for now. It's a pattern we have in the back of our mind to figure out how to try and tackle. Um, We've got uh, 970 opened by somebody, SY Gibson. I don't know who that is, but uh, they're a troublemaker. Um, Sorry, I 
was just asking. I was thinking if I, I'm putting labels in behind the scenes. I was wondering if yeah, I, I, I saw that. Thank you. Um, okay, so the issue here was uh, zero length JSON objects were being created and causing DRB to fail to start. This was due to some corruption. Uh, customers saw uh, reproduce that by creating these sort of bogus zero length JSON objects. Um, I know we had some uh, patches and uh, fixes go in towards this. Um, yeah, uh, I closed a hole that um, where we weren't uh, syncing in a place where we should have that can cause um, zero link files to appear if the system reboots before it was able to flush the, before the kernel was able to lazily flush the data down to the file system. Okay. Um, That'll close one one possible cause. The other one, um, I started some work on a write-ahead log scheme, and that turned out to be uh, a lot more work than uh, I had my initial optimistic expectations. Uh, okay. We're tuned for, go figure. And so that is kind of backburnered for now. So, okay, so I, I will verify that the zero length issue uh, doesn't cause, um, well, actually, that's a question. Um, does the actual zero length JSON object still cause DRP to fail to start up with this patch? Yes. Okay, so it does not fix the fact that zero lengths will cause DRP to fail to start, but fixes some potential creation of zero length JSON objects. Yeah, it fixes a hole that would, uh, it, it fixes one of the, it, it fixes probably what is the major cause of uh, the major way to create zero length files, which is to basically unexpectedly reboot the box. All right, so what about our stance on somehow zero length? JSON files show up, should we fail to actually start up if those are in our uh, writable layer? Uh, I don't have a good way to detect them, so we should just explode, which is I think what we do right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so I will, all right, I'll, um, I'll review this and write up and I'll touch base with uh, the customer that reported it and see if uh, they can make sure they're running this current version and see if they can recreate the problem. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the customer, the cause there where they were running it in a VM that was running on flaky hardware and it would just crash over and over again. Yep, So they were able to reproduce it pretty easily. It's a beautiful thing about yeah. flaky hardware and VMs. Uh, plugins define uh, is not printing by default. Um, uh, plugin define functions are not print by default and needs fixed. I have no idea what I meant by that. Um, um, yeah. Additional info. <laughs> I need to check it. It may actually be fixed. Okay. But the idea was that uh, plugins, you should be able to get information about a plugin just by running it on the command line and saying plugin to Ah, that's right. Yeah. And I think one of the latest changes when we were passing around new socket pipes and stuff are causing it to fail. And I think that's been resolved, but I'll need to uh, look at it. It's a, it's strangely enough, it's a bug because it used to work. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Greg will verify that. Um, One of the things that this was intended to do was you were supposed to be able to get information about a plugin without having to load it into DRP. And so this was a side effect. I got really tired of Terraform where you have to actually start Terraform, pull in a plugin before you can get information about a plugin because you can't run the plugin until you actually run it in Terraform. So I found that very annoying. And so I wanted our plugins to be able to tell you about them without actually having to run them. And so okay. uh, define was the attempt for that. So I need to look Okay. This. Excellent. Um, error while editing stage in Racken portal. Uh, so this was. I, fix, I fixed that. Um, we're just waiting for a verification back from the user. Yeah, I would suggest we close it from that perspective. Okay. Uh, would you go ahead and please close it and just note that if it has any issues? Okay. Yep. Oh, I didn't see. It. There you go. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, 908, uh, add links to profiles on machine objects. Um, I think that this was. I did that too. Yep. Okay, that's done. 
stuff, I'll label it and fix it. Uh, add support for VBox web server into the VirtualBox IPMI. Uh, this came in from community from JTIR. Um, <laughs> how much did I pay him for this? Yeah, none actually. Um, so I think this is just still uh, outstanding whether or not we choose to do it. Yep. Yep, okay. yep. Now it's adding external uh, calls to VirtualBox to be able to manage uh, VirtualBox uh, machines from remote API, which is problematic. Yeah. Greg doesn't I, like it. What I might, I might, do I have a future? This is a, yeah. I just threw it into the future release milestone, which is a parking lot, which is a. Uh, this um, comes in from uh, community as well. Unbundle of the contrib content fails. So if you uh, do a DRP CLI contents unbundle on the YAML uh, artifact, then it fails. Um, we've had sort of a storied history with this here and there. Um, I don't know if we made any fixes around this or whether it should be fixed. It's pretty old. I think we did some fixes around it. Um, oh, Chris, you're on with us right now. Um, so if you're listening, this is for you. This is part of your test question we talked about earlier is, could you please verify in current uh, 3100 if this fails for you still, uh, un unbundle of contrib? Yeah, all the content packs and tip and latest or in the current released ones have been updated to not have this issue. Cool. So excellent. Um, so Chris, if you could validate, we'll close this. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Thank you, sir. Um, objects that become invalid panic the renderer from D. Anderson May. Um, apply a workflow to the machine, it stalls terminal running DRP, panics every few seconds. We, we added a lot of protections on um, render, error, render errors. I thought we fixed this. Actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in... Supported back in May. I, I'm fairly certain we've taken care of this one by now. Yeah, this there's a whole class of things that got fixed, and it may already be in three ten. Yeah, it's in three ten. That um, that specific case is caught and now thrown as a log message, and will also get associated with um, depending on where the error occurs. It also gets associated as an error on the machine now. So that you can actually get the exact line number inside the template that is actually broken. So okay. there's a whole lot of changes for this. Okay. For this very purpose, because I got tired of seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, community installer boot ends, uh, set up an account with hard coded password and default config. Uh, yeah. They are not hard coded. Well, it's hard coded. Um, if you don't provide a pass, um, a pram. Well, his it, this is a philosophical discussion <laughs> because I just said all the things you did, and then he responded, and basically we discussed this, and this. and it has to do with. Should you do things that are dangerous by default, right? And so his philosophy is don't have a password, make people set that parameter and don't set it and have the system explode if you fail to set a password for your own stuff your own way. Okay, that is a safety thing to keep people from running with scissors. It hasn't been our philosophy on some of this stuff, right? We've warned you, don't do silly things like don't, you know, provision something on the public internet with a password that everybody knows, right? Okay. Yep. Um, change it. There's the parameter. We document the parameter. Have fun. The, right, Dave's yeah. counter argument in this discussion was, yeah, but I don't know better, so you just let me do something really stupid. It's a 
trade, we've chosen to make it simpler to use on startup, right? So that's where yep. we go. Could, could we have like a productionized content pack that sets this? I mean, is it- well, is so I, that's actually a good question, Rob. And we've talked around this subject a little bit with, and I injected the uh, crypt content uh, parameter is production. So the concept of um, let you do fast, easy patterns, unless I set it to this is a production machine and I want to not honor those fast patterns that might make things insecure. Now that's sort of a very generalized concept and it has implications throughout a lot of things like things like this setting and allowing default passwords uh, your stance on SSH uh, keys and SSH root and turning off uh, access with a uh, passwords versus SSH keys right so those are all sort of um, policies that relate to dev pattern versus production pattern so there might be a larger thing to think about there in terms of um, when you install you know, DRP, you have to specify your initial use case pattern and we can enable in content from that in those various places. Mm. I don't know, something to that effect, or it could be just, you know, a setting, a system wide setting and our default is production if you want to do play mode switch it to dev and then you can do these easy patterns yeah i we have the same i know offline mode versus connected mode um we've we've been consistently because it's so hard for you know you're, it's a learning curve problem right if you if you add things that make that learning curve harder then this whole system is much much less approachable once somebody's more experienced understanding these things is is sort of de facto right that it becomes manageable yeah i mean especially in this particular case right from my perspective one of the first skills that as a operator you get to deal with is setting parameters on machines right or profiles yep. and this is or you know just right. read the documentation right and yeah. this is one of those okay. we both know that people don't do that by default so i, I wouldn't know. even bring reading the documentation up <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but but it's present users you know accepted <laughs> so so i think um i think what we should do in in this case now sort of in an expediency sake is uh we need to kind of review our, our position around this and how we want to approach the larger problem which is sort of intertwined with the dev versus prod and the online versus offline discussion and how we want to handle that pattern i'm i'm in agreement greg with you that people should learn how to operate the system before they go stick it in production environments and public internet spaces. But the reality is people will do that, which is why things like virtual machine cloud images are now baked without username passwords because people kept doing stupid things like spinning up a thousand of them with a default username password and then they're owned. You know, my quick and surly answer is don't use Beautiful. community content in production. Community content is there as a learning aid. If you use it directly in production, well, that's that. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're echoing sort of the same sentiment, uh, Victor. It's just the, the philosophical discussion still exists around, I think, um, we let them be easy and usable. Um, we give them hooks not to install community content and that would fix the problem because there's nothing it can do then. There is no provisioning it can do then, right? So. Well, no, but. Shane, the idea is that community content is there for our community as a learning aid for people to write their own content packs. Once people get started writing content bundles, it turns out that they don't really think that it's that hard. And, uh, you know, they can take our params and uh, if they don't like our defaults, change them in their own content bundles. I, I, I totally agree, Victor, except the reality is people don't treat it that way. And they will take the community pack, slap it in place, and they go, oh, great, I can spin up CentOS bare metal yep. machines instantly. I Boom. Agree. I'm done. It's Job done. Shane, I... uh, position on that one. Yeah, it's pretty common. Uh, yeah, I, I understand it's pretty common, but, you know, you also got to understand that we optimize the community, the community content so that people can learn how to use the product. 
which I agree is a good, yeah. very, very good thing because it wasn't easy from the beginning when I started using uh, uh, DR provision. So oh yeah, community content was or the community content was much uh, had much sharper edges back then. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right, so I think we have a larger discussion to have here, and we all have opinions about it, and I think we all sort of parallel our, in concept. It's just a matter of figuring out how to apply that in a system. Um, what's the right choice? The right choice might be, sorry, Dave, um, we're happy with our stance. Go learn how to set parameters before you deploy something. Um, we provide the hooks to be able to change those things. Yep. Um, they want to they want to use different default passwords. Just shove it in the shove it in the global profile. Done. <laughs> I know we ha we have the pattern there to do that. So yeah, it's a it's a larger philosophical discussion, like I said, and differing opinions on what should be the default stance. Um, with that said, we're at sixty minutes now. We're at the top of our hour. Um, thank you, everybody, for your feedback. We're going to wrap things up. Uh, we'll probably add the bug scrub into future ones to try and catch up on uh, the bug scrub path. Uh, look forward to seeing you in two weeks on the 25th of September, I believe it is, if my 11 plus 14 math doesn't fail me. Uh, Mrs. LaFrance would be uh, happy to hear that. Uh, I think Greg has something to say before we wrap up and close out. Actually, I have a question for Stan. Stan, can I clone your... Uh... Ansible playbook and start messing with it. Go for it. Cool. We Just might, wanted to make sure. We might clone it into digital rebar. Clone it into digital rebar so that we can start having it as a more direct example. Try and make Yeah, it that's fine. Cool. I will cool. push up my, actually I do have a bunch of updates that I want to make uh, to it. Okay. Um, especially with the updated version of uh, DR provision, so. Give, it, um, give us a shout when you get it pushed, and then we'll 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 clone it into rebar so people are aware of it. You know, they can use it as a starting point. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Thank you. Sorry, Shane. Oh no, that's awesome. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate all your involvement. That's a wrap on version twenty-five.